All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week. And this is episode 60. We are, well, <laughs> we've gone quite a way. So, yeah, I thought I would change the structure of the podcast just a tiny bit because I feel like I've been spending too much time talking about the getting started articles and, you know, beginner articles that basically I don't really have much to say about, but yet I still go through them and try to explain what they do, even though majority of time is actually apparent from the headers, right, from the titles. So here's what I'm going to do. I have created a separate section called getting started that will contain all of those articles and... In the beginning of the episode, I will just go through them, read you the titles, and then you decide if that sounds interesting or not, because, well, they are pretty much self scripturing And um, yeah, you know, if you don't, if you don't want to know about that, then you don't want to know about that. That's basically it. So let's get started. The first section we got here is getting started. And the stuff we get here today is, first of all, full blown monorepo setup walkthrough. This is, as you might guess, uh, the walkthrough on how to set up monorepos, specifically with Lerna. So if that helps, uh, do check it out. Uh, hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. The next article we got in getting started section is formatting dates with JavaScript. So if you're just getting started with the dates, do check this one out. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. Next getting started article we got is newbie guide for socket.io. So if you are looking at the socket.io and don't know where to start, have a look at this one. Next one we got is application state management with React. This one is from Mr. Let me try that again. From Mr. Can't See Dodds. And it talks about why you might not need anything but React itself to manage the state within your application. Which basically showcases the usage of the React context and uh, yeah, for global state management, that's basically all it does. Next thing we got here is learning JavaScript with Hedvix. Uh, this is a book uh, in a repo with a bunch of code samples and stuff like this. So if you're just getting started with JavaScript, this probably is a good point to do this. Next article is Fusebox, type-centric code bundler introduction. Uh, just as the title says, introduction to the Fusebox. I never use it myself since, you know, I'm not very TypeScript person. But if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next article we got is a linguistic introduction to D3JS, a walkthrough through the logic of the D3JS authors, I guess, uh, to show you how and why the methods are named and how do you actually use them, at least in a very basic level, which actually makes quite a lot of sense. So if you wanted to get started working with D3JS, but was intimidated by the number of methods it has, which you can easily be, right? Uh, this is a very good article that um, explains why and how they work. Next thing we got here is making a Reddit reply bot. Simple tutorial on creating a simple Reddit bot. How to avoid this React, uh, wait, what? How to avoid this React hooks performance pitfall. Um, is this, yes, this is how it's called. I somehow didn't notice it first time, but um, this is basically talks about the common React hook performance pitfalls and how to avoid them. So there you go. Next article we got is building awesome command line interfaces with JavaScript and Ocliff. This is a tutorial for the Ocliff uh, command line uh, library, basically. So if that sounds interesting, check it out. Next article we got is minimalistic nav menu with Vue.js and Greensock uh, library. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There's some fancy animations over there. Uh, next one we got is a closer look at React memoize hooks, use ref, use callback and use memo. So yeah, just as the title says, a uh, deeper dive into the all the memoization hooks that React has and how they impact the performance and when you should use them and how do you use them. And the last one we got here in the new getting started section for today is how I accidentally made a game engine from scratch with vanilla JavaScript, a pretty thorough write up on how to build your own engine in game engine in JavaScript. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Um, this is it for the getting started section. Do let me know if you think that this format is better for the basically getting started articles, the tutorials, all the basic stuff, or you think maybe I should go through them the way I did before within the article news and uh, or, you know, bit sized awesomeness if they are smaller. So uh, I'm leaving that up to your feedback. But I think cutting it down to just five minutes of, you know, 10 articles sounds like a nice reduction in time for this podcast, because we are quite long. 
But okay, let us switch to the actual articles and news, like the proper ones, the interesting ones. The first one we got here is from The Guardian, uh, the newspaper, and it's called Revisiting the Rendering Tier. This is a conceptual write-up, so there's not much technical details in here, but there is a lot of uh, sort of discussion and talk. This is an article that talks about uh, The Guardian moving from six, nearly 63,000 lines of SAS to CSS in JS. And how they did it, why they did it, what kind of challenges did they met doing that, and so on and so forth. So if you are working with extremely large uh, CSS or SAS or you know basically any CSS related language code bases, and you are thinking about moving to CSS and JS, then I would highly recommend this article because there are some very interesting details here, and the reasoning as to why they decided to move to CSS and JS is also pretty fascinating. So that sounds interesting. Definitely check it out. Hey, Uncle, welcome to the stream. It's better. Well, thank you for the feedback. So I would leave the judgment, you know, until after majority of people watch this thing. But I feel like this is also better. So it's like, we can just skip through the majority of that stuff, you know, and not um, ponder upon this. But okay, let us continue with the articles. Next article we got here is this guy's driven testing just mocks in depth part two. We already had the part one on this podcast, I think, two or three episodes back. And um, part one was basically introduction to mocking in jest in general. And this one is more in-depth dive into how you can actually mock specific third-party modules to create predictable tests that won't just break randomly when you slightly change things, right? So in this example, they just use lodash unique ID function that does this and uh, make it predictable basically, right? Because mm, the function itself just generates uh, unique IDs whenever you call it, right? So it will depend on the call order. And in this case, you don't really wanna have that in tests because the tests will break if as soon as you just slightly move them around or add a new test in between and so on and so forth. So the idea is to sort of make it predictable and make it always generate the same uh, values when you want it. So um, if that sounds interesting, definitely check it out. It's a really good guide uh, for the just mocks. Once again, just mocks can be absolutely invaluable. And uh, yeah, that's a good explanation how to use them. Next article we got here is Elixir, Phoenix, Absinthe, GraphQL, React, and Apollo, an absurdly deep dive. Just as the title says, this is an absurdly deep dive into the whole stack that I just named. And by absurdly deep dive, I mean that you probably would take, I don't know, about an hour to read that. Yeah, okay, there's a timer here yeah so 53 minutes read as it says it is very long and very detailed uh, but it's also really cool to read about because there is a lot of uh, very intricate technical details and um, yes this is actually why I picked it for the podcast uh, Uncle Code Sandbox uses exactly the same stack so it's actually a quite common stack now uh, the programming language for the backend here as you might imagine is Elixir if you never heard about it uh, this is a language that runs on top of the Erlang VM and uh, it's actually really cool. It's sort of like Ruby-like on top of Erlang VM, which is extremely powerful on its own. So Erlang was built for telecoms if you uh, never heard about it. And it's absolutely fascinating to learn it actually. So I never, you, I, I learned Elixir, I tried it in a couple of pet projects, but I never had to use it in production yet. But I absolutely love the language. It, it's it's really, really cool. So if you never heard about it, definitely check this article out and maybe learn some Elixir because it's it's kind of cool. So the Phoenix is the framework for Elixir uh, for the backend. It's sort of like Ruby on Rails or I guess uh, Meteor for um, Node.js, right? GraphQL is, as you might imagine, is exactly what you expect. Absinthe is the Elixir GraphQL framework. And then Apollo and React, as you probably already know, this is Apollo is the uh, library for consuming GraphQL API in React or JavaScript and React is, well, React. So there you go. If you are curious to see how all of that works together in a very, very detailed way, then definitely check out this article. It is really good. Again, Elixir is a really cool language. It is like has a lot of functional concepts. So I would highly recommend learning it uh, if you are interested in functional programming. Like it's not purely functional language, like for example, Haskell, but still is a really interesting one. All right, continue. 
We got a year with Spectre, a V8 perspective, a blog post from the V8 dev team that talks about addressing uh, the Spectre and Meltdown um, vulnerabilities that uh, was disclosed a year ago, I guess now? No, it's even more, January 2018. So it's like a year and a half, right? And uh, living with those vulnerabilities within JavaScript, right? Because as it turns out, you can actually use JavaScript to extract stuff that shouldn't be extracted well on a system level basically right and this article talks about what exactly are the problems what exactly are the mitigations and how did the v8 team actually dealt with them there is some pretty crazy details in here uh, it does assume sort of very basic understanding of what is spectra and meltdown but they do explain it as well uh, like on a very high level here in the beginning so if you never heard about them, do check it out as well. Um, I guess, you know, the article basically has everything you need to know about Spectre and Meltdown to understand the rest of it, essentially. But it is a fascinating write-up. Um, you know, it's very interesting to see how exactly the engine team actually meet tries to mitigate Spectre and Meltdown, even though I think there's been a new research that actually shown you cannot mitigate them completely with software. So essentially the modern CPU's architecture is completely broken. And if anyone can execute arbitrary code on your computer, you're essentially screwed, right? So with JavaScript, it's a bit harder obviously to escape the sandbox, but yeah, this is, this is a tough challenge. And I'm kind of curious to see whether the newer CPU models was actually uh, disregard the speculative execution at all, or whether we're going to see some other changes to the overall CPU architecture, because, you know, it's sort of not very nice to live with two unpatchable vulnerabilities on a hardware level. So there you go. All right. Next uh, article we got here is passing structured data between C++ and JavaScript in WebAssembly. So this, this talks about uh, building a WebAssembly module for Node.js and then passing the data between JavaScript and essentially C++, right? Uh, I, from my experience, this is sort of the most painful part of building both native and WebAssembly modules because just writing the code right now is very easy, right? So there's no, not that much barrier, not that many barriers anymore in just building a module, be it in C++ and then using it natively in Node.js or be it in WebAssembly or be it in JavaScript, right? It's all very simple. But once you come to the point where you say, okay, so I build this WebAssembly module or I build a C++ module and then connected it to Node.js, you will be at the point where you say, okay, so now I actually need to pass this object from JavaScript side and plug it into my C++ code or WebAssembly code. And this is where it gets kind of tricky. So I wouldn't say like, it, it can be complicated at times, but it's usually just, um, I guess annoying, right? Annoying would be a right word here. So if you are thinking about working on native modules or WebAssembly modules, or if you're already working and already encountered this problem, which is highly likely that you did, then definitely check out this article. It talks about one of the approaches you could take on when passing the data around between JavaScript and uh, native code, essentially. It is a very good write-up and it's a Crazy solution. I know that in, on Twitter when during the discussion, some people said that there are basically easier ways, but this is just one of the ways of doing that. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next article we got here is you should never ever run directly against Node.js in production, maybe. Now, um, it actually took me a while to understand what the hell does this mean? run directly against Node.js in production. So what author actually talks about here is that you should almost never um, or at least the core point of the article is, is you should never run your server or whatever script using nodes spacebar script, right? Because if you have errors in your script, it's going to crash and then everything's going to be unavailable for all the users, even though the error was in like one of the methods. And the suggested solutions are things like PM2, which is a great thing, or, you know, like supervisor or whatever. Um, which is fine, like this is one of the ways of doing it, right? But in my opinion, writing unit tests and accounting for errors that can happen and that can actually crash your app is a way better approach. And then again, uh, PM2 is nice, but this is not the only way to make your application uh, restart, right? So 
I mean, it's 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 one of the approaches. Let's just put it this way. So if, if that sounds interesting, if you want to know how to make your application a bit more resilient to the errors, although I would um, I would basically I'm not sure if I would prefer this way because when you do auto restarts you have to have some sort of a reporting that tells you that hey there's actually something broken so you gotta have a look at that right and if everything crashes you know that immediately because your user starts complaining which is sub perfect but you know if you're running demo projects for example that's totally fine on the other hand um i guess i would prefer monitoring solution that basically notifies me when something is wrong and then restarts that automatically i don't know if pm2 can actually do that I never used it uh, that much because I typically run my stuff inside Docker, which basically allows you to do that. But um, yeah, again, you know, if you're just getting started, I guess, and uh, you are curious as to how do you handle the crashes in Node for a variety of reasons, then this is one of the approaches. So definitely check this article out if that sounds interesting. Next article we got here is level up command line playgrounds with WebAssembly. Um, this is a pretty cool one. It's not a very long one, but it talks about taking the very nice uh, command line tool called JQ that allows you to parse JSON uh, by essentially providing a selector on command line and compiling it to WebAssembly to create an um, environment on the web where you can actually paste JSON and then specify the JQ command and get a result out of from it. Um, there's a brief tutorial on how you can actually uh, configure the JQ to, or you know, what tools do you need to use to build it as a WebAssembly module and how then to run it uh, in Node.js and how to actually include it in your page. The source is also available on GitHub if you're curious. And it's actually pretty cool that, you know, we're already at this stage where you can just take existing C tool, compile it to WebAssembly and then just run it in the browser with, within like 10 minutes, I guess. So if you know what you're doing, right? So there's an obviously caveat. You have to know about all the tools that are used in the article, but if you don't, and if you were looking to do something similar, then definitely check it out. This will guide you through all steps that you need to do to compile C, C++ tool to WebAssembly, which is uh, also quite nice. All right, next article we got here is comparing JVM alternatives to JavaScript. Um, so this one is a bit strange. I mean, it's, it's interesting nonetheless, but there are some sort of, um, flaws, I guess, in methodology that the author used. So the idea here is quite basic. We take uh, existing React application that is built without any bundler or without any JSX. So it's quite simple. He just includes the React and React DOM and then writes the index and counter components that are essentially written with the react.createElements uh, function calls and compares that using Lighthouse and Sizes to a bunch of applications that are produced uh, using a set of tools that compile Java to JavaScript. Uh, the specific list is G G uh, GVT, TVM, JSuite, ChirpJ, Vadinflow, and BCK to, I mean, I guess it's called back to browser, but <laughs> you know what? I'm just gonna call it back to browser. All right, and uh, yeah, so the comparison is very naive, but it's nonetheless quite interesting to see the difference. Uh, there are some uh, Java toolkits that actually allow you to achieve pretty neat results. Like, I think it was JSuite that actually resulted in, in a bundle that is just three kilobytes. The app works, you get native buttons, and you get nearly 100% score in Lighthouse, which is pretty damn impressive. So if you are working with Java and you are a Java person looking to build um, HTML web apps, essentially, do check it out. There are some interesting um, things in here. I also found it quite uh, interesting that, for example, the, uh, what was it called? Uh, ChirpJ which is basically full JVM implementation when you build um, a Java Swing app, actually takes the whole damn Swing app and puts it in your browser, which is quite amusing. And obviously that results in like 12 megabytes of, of <laughs> JavaScript, but hey, it actually works, which is pretty fascinating to be honest. So yes, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There's some uh, pretty cool stuff in here. All right. Um, that is it for the articles. Now we're coming to the short and bit-sized awesome things. 
The first one we got here today is this uh, pattern when you uh, use then and catch on any promise to simplify async await error handling. Um, so the author here uses array return. The, this is very similar to the way the Golang works, for example. Uh, typically, it returns the error in the first place in array and then the data in the second place in array. And you know, if there's no error, then you can just return the data, for example. What I prefer to do instead, because uh, you know, holes in array just look not nice to me, I guess uh, they just look a bit ugly. I typically use the same pattern, but instead of returning an array, I usually return an object with data and error properties. This way you can use destruction pretty much in the same way, but instead of array, you would have an object, right? And this can simplify the code quite a bit. So if you have complex error handling, that obviously that won't help you. But if it's for something as simple, you know, if there's an error, then I just rethrow it or I do something very simple, then this pattern works really, really well. So if you haven't heard about it, do check this one out. It's pretty cool. Next article we got, or I guess next news we got here is faster input events with Facebook's first browser API contribution. So Facebook is joining a uh, browser API working group, I guess. Uh, and um, they are W3C member, if you didn't know. And their first contribution is the new API called is input pending, which allows you as a developer to figure out in your source code if there is an input pending from the user side so that you can actually interrupt your scheduled heavy work and pass on the uh, main thread essentially to the user, right? So user can um, easily do something uh, and not get slowed down by your heavy computations in the background, which is quite nice. So it's a, it's a pretty neat API. I guess it's not gonna be used that widely um, manually, right? I'm guessing it's gonna be a part of frameworks like React that would sort of automate this for you in majority of cases because you rarely handle the inputs yourself, but uh, it's nice to have anyway. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Numeric separators was shipped in Chrome 75. So you can now actually write very large numbers in a more readable format, which is always nice to have. If you're curious, do check this one out. Um, next thing we got here is a very, very large thread from Dan Abramov uh, on concurrent mode uh, being just a workaround for virtual DOM diffing. So this is the whole uh, the whole discussion sparked out from the Swell 3 announcement, which we're going to talk about a bit later, which um, basically the guys behind Swell claimed that the virtual DOM is just an you know unnecessary overhead that should not be there in a UI library. And Dan here argues that this is just one of the approaches and what sort of advantages and disadvantages does it have essentially. It's a really cool thread, so if you're interested, do check it out. There's some really interesting things to be picked up over here. All right, next thing we got here is the book called JavaScript Alon, Alon Gay. I'm, I'm not sure how to read that, Alon J, Alon Gay. Uh, I feel like this is a French word, but I have no idea how to read that. JavaScript, I, I'm just gonna say JavaScript Alon, Alon J. Probably that's the correct way. The sixth edition uh, is now uh, free or I guess also available for free. So this is a book that goes under pay what you want uh, pricing. And um, until now the minimal price was set to something, I'm not even sure, but now it's actually free. So if you don't have any money, but still want to read it. And I've heard about a lot about, uh, like a lot of good things about the book itself, then you can just do it free. So there you go. Uh, Alonje, you read it right in the French. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Baco. <laughs> right, you know French. Okay, I keep forgetting about that. Okay, so I guess my French is not completely terrible. <laughs> so there you go. So yes, if you're interested to have a look, uh, there is a lot of very good uh, feedback about this book on Twitter, at least. Um, so there you go. All right, next thing we got here is the announcement from the Next.js team. Uh, the TypeScript support will be available quite soon. So there's a pull request that adds uh, TypeScript support out of the box essentially. And uh, yes, yeah, soon you will be able to write your Next.js apps in TypeScript without any additional steps, which is kind of good for you, I guess, if you're using TypeScript. Right, the next announcement we got here is the testing library updates. Um, it, there's basically a bunch of new releases. There is now a new GitHub org specifically for the testing libraries and they are now joining Open Collective and there is now a Twitter account that will tweet everything related to testing library. So if you never heard about it, uh, testing library is this 
sort of umbrella of libraries for testing things, including React testing library, which is actually super neat and makes React testing very easy. But they also have a DOM testing library that works with DOM, view testing library that works with view, native testing library that works with React Native, and so on and so forth. And there's like 25 variants now. And all of them are really good. So if you never heard about them, definitely check it out. Um, if you did, then well, there is now sort of one place to uh, navigate all of them and uh, sort of they're streamlining the whole thing uh, in a bunch of ways. So that's all the good news, basically. All right, next thing we got here is, right, we are coming to the releases section now. Do we have some releases this week around, man? Okay, so the first thing we got here is Node.js version 12, which um, yes, has been teased, um, I think at the beginning of week and then they suddenly released it two days later, I think, which was a big surprise to me. I mean, I guess I don't track it close enough, but we got Node.js version 12. Uh, there are few very big things that it includes. First one being V8 version 7.4, which means that this is actually on par with the current Chrome version 74, right? So we actually get all the newest, coolest things that you have in V8.7.4 right in Node.js. Uh, that being, I think the my favorite ones are essentially the async stack traces, which make it way nicer to debug async await code and promises. Um, has obviously speed improvements, but there is also stuff like class properties, private ones as well and a bunch of other related um, JavaScript features like Intel and you know some other things. So if you're curious, do check it out. There is a lot of new things to try out basically. We got TLS 1.3, which is always, always good. A bunch of changes under the hood. And uh, one of the cool things is that we get the first version of the new ES6 module support shipped. Uh, there's a separate blog post over here. It's linked from the announcement post so if you're curious, it's still experimental, right? So the ES6 modules are still experimental, but this is the new version that actually works with uh, common JS modules that is way easier to use than what was originally suggested. And uh, it is now basically shipped in Node 12. So you can just add a flag and try it out. And yeah, it, it actually looks really good. So I cannot wait for this to be finished and to be usable without any experimental flags. I mean, you can obviously do that with ESM for example now, but hey, having the modules in Node.js uh, that allow imports would be um, really, really cool. So there you go. All right, next release we got here is Svelte 3, Rethinking Reactivity. So Svelte is the UI framework similar to, you know, React, Vue, whatever, and, uh, Version two was, I mean, looking fine, but I don't know, it didn't catch my attention for any reason, but Svelte 3 is actually looking absolutely amazing. Now, one of the things that I already pointed out before is that there is no VDOM, right? So they actually um, say, okay, there's not gonna be any VDOM. We're actually gonna take a completely different approach to doing that and gonna be a lot faster than the libraries with VDOM which is you know, valid approach and um, they can actually do that because Svelte is not just UI framework, it's also a compiler. So they have their own .svelte file format and um, the way that they do the changes and track the changes and do updates is actually by instrumenting the code, which I thought was really, really cool. So the Svelte 2 used to have the more or less the same way that the React work, you know, you got the, this dot get method that gets you the state and then you can use this dot set to set the state, which well, not that different from React. Uh, but it, it's, yeah, as they note here, it felt cumbersome, right? Is it didn't, didn't feel right. So what they did is they actually, because they are a compiler, they can do like quite a lot of very cool things. One of them being, they can actually look at your code and say, okay, here's, you are actually changing the variable that is used in the state. So we're actually gonna add an instrumenting uh, function call that says invalidate count and re-render whatever is related to this variable, which is a really simple way of doing this, but a really, really cool, right? So I, like, at least to me, this looks just in absolutely ingenious. <laughs> I love it. Um, the other cool thing is that basically it also compiles CSS. So for example, they can do things like do not include the unused CSS in the bundle you use. They also will not include the unused Svelte features in the bundle that you don't use and so on and so forth. 
There is a really, really cool video talk from Rich Harris, one of the uh, contributors and co-creators, I think, of the Svelte. It's called Rethinking Reactivity that talks specifically about what they did for version three and how exactly it works. So if you're interested and, uh, you know, if you, if you work with the UI, you should be interested. I would definitely suggest checking this out because there are some absolutely awesome ideas there. Um, one of the unexpected things actually was that, uh, so Svelte has the store integrated into the Svelte itself, right? So if you want a global state, you have the Svelte slash store, I believe, and you can just use it. Uh, now, the thing is that it uses the subscribe and unsubscribe methods, and it has the additional syntactic sugar that allows you to automatically subscribe and unsubscribe uh, or Svelte to automatically handle the subscription, unsubscription, and the view, right? And someone noticed that it looks very, very similar to observables, as in, you know, the RxJS and the official observable spec. So what the guys um, on Svelte did, they actually, they looked at that and were like, yeah, that does look very similar. So they actually released version 3.1. Uh, where is the change log? Uh, there we go. They released the version 3.1 that actually supports observables out of the box. So you can just take your RxJS and... Um, use it as a variable inside of your view without anything else. And this is just freaking awesome. Like just, I don't think there's any other UI library right now out there that allows you to do, to work with RxJS on this simple level. And this was really exciting to me. I don't know about you. Um, not always perfect. Like I tried using Svelte 3 myself uh, because, you know, all of those features looked really exciting. So I thought, that I, you know, I'd do a deep dive and try to write something with it. It is incredibly impressive, but um, it seems like they released the Svelte 3 itself, but um, the tooling around the Svelte is not, was not yet updated at the time when I tried it. So they have this Sapper framework that is basically Next.js for Svelte. And at the moment when I tried it, it was actually not supporting Swell 3. And it seems like they haven't released uh, the latest version that basically supports, supports Swell 3 yet. The same goes for a lot of tooling for like, you know, VS Code extensions and um, ESLint plugins. All of them were still working only for Swell 2 and because they did a lot of breaking changes, it was a bit frustrating to work with it, but um, nonetheless, this is definitely a framework to keep an eye on. It especially cool, they have this feature, I, I completely forgot about that, but one of the coolest things they have is this feature called derivatives. So the idea is that you can actually have this, um, um, number one, you can have two variables, right? So you can have, say we have number one, we have number two, right? And we can say, okay, so numbers. I, I just really want to show this. I'm sorry. <laughs> we got number one, we got number two, right? So this is literally all you can, all you have to do to print two things. And say we, we, we want to do the reactive rendering. So we can do result, right? So the thing is results, if we define it like this, number one plus number two. Um, this will work once, right? So, but if we say, okay, input value, um, I think there was a way to bind it to, uh, wait a second. There was a way in the docs to do auto bindings and DOM elements, uh, bind the related elements. There we go. Input radio binds. I think it's just bind value if I remember correctly. Yep, there you go. So you can just bind the value, which is also quite handy. And if you can see this works, right? But this doesn't update the result. Now, here's the cool thing. They have this special um, operator. So they, they actually abuse the JavaScript. They have the special dollar operator that allows you to create dynamic bindings, which means that as soon as I change this, it will actually, um, okay, I actually, <laughs> actually screwed up because this binds, it seems to bind it as a string, right? So we get the string concatenation, but you get the idea. So you can actually specify these dynamic bindings that derive variables from other variables, which is 
just awesome like look at this 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 is just freaking great and um, there is a lot more features like this so if if you are as intrigued as i am definitely check svelte out uh, and because yeah the version 3 just looks mind-blowing okay continuing with the releases we got uh, chrome 74 which is now uh, stable the biggest feature being the private class fields uh, because we got v8 and 4 and a bunch of other improvements so you know if you're interested do check them out next release we got here is create react app version 3.0 that uh, basically updates the jest version 24 and adds hook support as well as typescript linting i believe using uh, the new eslint config uh, so if you are using um, create react app make sure to update there seems to be quite a lot of improvements the next release we got here is app p version 1.0 it's a very neat uh, uploading library for files essentially that works with well just about everything yeah it's it's quite nice i use it in a couple of projects so if you never heard about it do check it out it's finally version 1.0 uh, after three years of development i think it was stable enough when i used it when it was like 0. Point whatever but yes now it's officially 1.0 which is nice to have next release we got here is jspm 2.0 beta release uh, so the if you never heard about it, JSPM is the package manager that sort of aims to provide NPM style uh, workflow that allows you to install and require uh, modules directly in the browser. So it sort of maps your node modules, maps the common JS into the ES modules on the fly and allows you to do to work with them in the browser uh, without any additional steps. Um, they seem to have um, use the new import maps that just been shipped in a, under experimental features in Chrome 64 to sort of enhance this. I personally never used it because I don't know, I don't see any, I haven't seen any point in doing this so far, at least in the projects I work with, but uh, nonetheless, it is really interesting. So keep an eye on that. Next release we got here is React Redux version 710 alpha. Uh, this one is finally includes Redux hooks so you can actually use react redux with hooks so if you're curious you can try it out again it's just alpha for now so uh, things might break make sure to keep that in mind when trying it out but uh, it seems like the official release is quite soon and uh, last release we have here for today is rxjs650 which adds a bunch of minor features uh, my favorite one is actually from fetch that allows you to create observable from a native fetch function that is lazy and cancelable using the observable itself, which is just really, really cool. So there you go. All right, that is it for leases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos. Uh, the first library we got here is Papa Parse, a powerful in-browser CSV parser for big boys and girls, as it says. And it's like, it's just a CSV parser, right? But um, First of all, it, it's really cool. It's really well written. It works really fast. It says it's the fastest one, uh, but this is not what I want to highlight. Like, can we just take a moment to appreciate how well all the documentation is written for this thing, right? There is, this is just basically everything you ever want to know in the docs. There is so many cases that are basically shown in this that are real world cases like, hey, uh, there are numbers parse the string. How do I do that? Or, hey, I actually want to do a separate thread for parsing in a browser. You know, I want to use workers. How do I do that? Or, hey, I actually want to parse very big files and stuff like this, which is really damn impressive. So if you write docs, this is a really good reference of how to properly do that. Okay, next demo we got here is GB Studio, a visual retro game maker. Now this is mind blowing. This is um, an Electron app that allows you to create a Game Boy ROMs right in it. You can actually write your own Game Boy uh, games in 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 an um, Electron app, <laughs> which is really awesome. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Apps Starter up. Uh, Get in it. Let's try again. Apps Script Starter. A local development environment for Google Apps Script, uh, which allows you to essentially do that in VS Code, I believe. Uh, so if you're working with Google Apps Script and wanted to develop it locally, then check this one out, uh, might help you. Next demo we got here is reattempt. Give your functions another chance, um, sort of a decorator function that allows you to rerun anything uh, any number of times. 
seems to be uh, tailored around promises essentially. So I'm not sure if it works with non-promise functions, but uh, there you go. All right, next demo we got here is Tailwind CSS, a utility first CSS framework for rapidly building custom user interfaces. And they are nearly here with CS, uh, Tailwind CSS version 1.0. There's already beta available. It looks quite nice. Like it looks pretty slick and uh, has a bunch of components and everything. So, you know, if you were looking for another framework, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. I'm not sure about the size, uh, but yeah. As it says, this is not a framework like Bootstrap Foundation or Bulima. It is not a UI kit. So uh, maybe that's interesting for you. All right, next demo we got here is React SE uh, or ESI, I guess, blazing fast server-side rendering for React and Next.js. This is essentially a plugin for Next.js that allows you to speed up your server-side rendering uh, by using, by storing fragments of server-side, re let me try that again, by storing fragments of server-side rendered pages in edge cache servers essentially, you know, caching layer for uh, server-side rendering of Next.js. Looks quite nice. So, you know, it seems quite easy to set up and it uh, seems like it will speed up your server-side rendering quite uh, a bit. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next demo we got here is Bento Starter, full stack open source solution to quickly building progressive web apps. Uh, it also says PVA applications, which is, you know, progressive web apps applications, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but there you go. Um, yeah, it's just uh, essentially scaffolds for your app using Vue, Vuex, Firestore, Firebase, Pretty Easily, and Jest Cypress for testing and all that kind of stuff. So if you wanted a quick start, there you go. Next thing we got here is Store On, a tiny 173 bytes event-based immutable state manager for React and Preact. So if you are looking for a super small store that is essentially based on events, then do check this one out. I mean, it looks quite nice. Um, not sure if I would take that over the hooks and context, but uh, yeah, maybe you do. Next thing we got here is Instagram private API. Node.js, Instagram private API client. Blah, blah. Why am I? <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Node.js, Instagram private API client. Written in TypeScript. Uh, the cool thing that I found it is basically it's not just a client that sort of, you know, takes and navigates to uh, Instagram because that's not too hard to do, right? This just reverse the API and do it. There's like a bunch of uh, things like this. But this one actually has a simulation commands that simulate the real user action as in like, okay, so here's actually the prior, uh, all requests prior to authorization that are happen in real Android application. So if you want to pretend to be an Instagram client really hard and make some bots, I guess, then uh, there you go. <laughs> this library can do a lot for you, basically. Okay, next thing we got here is Glue Gun, a delightful toolkit for building Node.js powered Please. Uh, and yeah, it's just another library for building command line interfaces. Seems quite nice. The main point is that it's extendable and allows you to use plugins, which do a bunch of things. Um, Looks okay, so I don't know if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Bent, a functional HTTP client for Node.js with async await. Um, also very minimalistic, but looks pretty cool. Essentially, you use the Bent function to create new function that does something like gets JSON or gets buffer, and then you use that get JSON or get buffer function to do a specific request. That looks like a pretty nice approach, actually, to be honest. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is negative array, the library that adds negative array index support using ES6, uh, sorry, ES2015 proxy. So essentially it wraps your array and allows you to do things like, you know, minus one, minus two, which will do the reverse lookup in the array, which is something, for example, like Python or Ruby, I believe support which I believe should be in the core of JavaScript, but uh, for now you can use this library, which is quite handy. Uh, it does rely on proxies, so uh, keep that in mind. Next thing we got here is fast.js, a serverless batch computing made simple. The library that basically takes your uh, JavaScript module and converts it to a function as a service uh, function specifically, right? And 
the cool thing, like there's a bunch of libraries like this already, but the cool thing I found here is actually it allows you to estimate the costs that you will have uh, on a bunch of different services uh, based on the execution time. So this is very interesting. If you are working out with the functions and services, then do check this one out. It also seems to estimate not just function call, but also calls to SQS, SNS, and all the other Amazon Web Services related costs. Uh, and it seems like it works with Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform as well, which is uh, pretty impressive to be honest. I think just the calculator itself would be worth, uh, worth it uh, to use this thing. So there you go. Next thing we got here is Sortable a JavaScript library for reordering drag and drop lists on modern browsers and touch devices. Uh, no jQuery supports Meteor, Angular, React, Polymer, Vue, Knockout, and basically anything else. Looks quite nice. I mean, you know, if I work on React, I prefer uh, something like React Beautiful DND anyway, but if I would uh, work with something else, then this would probably be worth looking at. So uh, do check it out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is uh, I like <laughs> it's called VAP, but that sounds terrible. So I'm just gonna call it WebAssembly Package Manager, and uh, it's from the guys who uh, did the Vasmer, I believe. Uh, I think it was Vasmer. Let me see. So yes, the guys who did the Vasmer um, compiler that allows you to do universal binaries powered with WebAssembly. So they created a WebAssembly package manager that actually allows you to create and publish your WebAssembly packages using a nice command line. And there's already like lolcat, cowsay, and all of that stuff that you can just uh, install with vapm and then run this module quite easily, right? Which seems quite nice. So I'm like, I'm not, um, I think the WebAssembly is gonna, play a big role in universal binaries and cross-platform development, but I don't know, like this, I'm not sure, basically I'm not sure I buy this just yet. Let's just put it this way. There's some weird things that I don't like. There's, there's already some crazy examples here. Somebody published Nginx here. You can you can literally install Nginx using VPM and then run it. Like that's, that's a thing that exists basically. It's impressive, but I don't know. I'm not convinced in its uh, practical applicability. Let's just put it this way. All right, the next thing we got here is open registry. I guess community got fed up by NPM drama and decided to take the matter in their own hands. So now we have a JavaScript package registry that is funded, developed, and maintained by the community, or at least so it says right now, we're gonna see how that develops. So the idea for now is that basically Currently, it just mirrors the NPM. Um, the, there is a disclaimer that says it is currently in alpha, so you might uh, encounter errors if you use it, so be careful about that. But I do welcome an initiative like this. This definitely seems like a proper, proper way of doing things. I guess I would really wanna see the NPM registry being handled by nonprofits or maybe even for-profit. Uh, no, I mean, for-profit would, would add additional layer of problems. Like, like, you know, like the current one, for example, there's like some terrible things happening there and it's just not looking very good. So nonprofit registry backed by big companies would be quite nice. I'm not sure if this one will fly, but uh, we're gonna see how that develops. All right, uh, next demo we got here is this land grab tool, um, which is kind of related to what we talked about, there was an article that basically showed you how to do that on your own. And this one essentially um, basically demos that. So it takes the elevation JSON and allows you to render it with a bunch of different textures from OpenStreetMap and uh, Mapbox. No, I think this one is actually specifically Mapbox. This looks really impressive and um, also a really cool demo. And you can actually select any area on the map that you want and it will dynamically generate this 3D visualization, which is kind of really cool. So there you go. Uh, I believe the code is actually available on GitHub. So that's also uh, kind of awesome. All right, and the next demo we got here is uh, when your friend throws you a dumb idea like URL-based graphic equalizer, don't think twice, just do it. And yes, there is an actual graphic equalizer for um, for a URL title bar. And yes, it works. And there is a source code that fits in, in a tweet, basically. <laughs> it is a bit ridiculous, but hey. 
All right, that is actually it for demos. Now we have the uh, two things that are sort of not quite JavaScript, but I thought would be interesting to highlight. The first one being Mozilla Internet Health Report that uh, outlines how healthy is the internet, talking about uh, how safe it is, how open it is, how uh, welcoming it is, who can succeed and who controls it. Uh, I also think I have JavaScript disabled, so none of this stuff shows up. Let me fix that real quick. Uh, yeah, there is essentially a collection of articles related to different topics like decentralization, like, um, I don't know, uh, what, what else is there? There's like, yeah, basically there's a bunch of topics uh, that I already outlined, like web literacy, like digital inclusion, like openness, and all of them talk about specific problems that we currently have on the internet. And it's quite interesting to see some of the insights. So if you are interested in this kind of meta discussion about the internet, I guess, do check it out. And the last thing we got here is the MuseNet presentation from OpenAI, which um, demos the MuseNet uh, neural network that uh, generates music and was trained on a bunch of different classical music and pop music. And you can even try to generate your own song from say Lady Gaga and Mozart, because why the hell not? And it actually generates a unique uh, composition each time you run it and you can actually listen to it. It does play in MIDI format, so it's not you know as impressive as it could have been, but uh, it, it's still quite interesting. Um, I talked to a few musician friends and they said that this is actually kind of garbage and not even that good, but melodically for a person who is not, you know, hardcore musician, it sounds okay-ish. So I guess that's an impressive step. Even though musicians are not very happy about that. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. All right, um, that is it from my side. Uh, so that was BXJS Weekly episode 60. If you guys have any questions or any suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If no, we can just wrap this up over here and go um, have an awesome rest of the weekend, I guess. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned either in our GitHub repo or on bxjs.dev website. We also have a Discord server. If you have any questions or want to talk about JavaScript or video games, feel free to join. Um, always nice to see more people there. Seems like there is no more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show or thank you for listening if you're doing that on a podcast format, I guess. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for your continued support. Have an awesome weekend or awesome rest of the week and I see you next time. Bye.